the culpability that we have that we really didn't we we don't we let we let people wh whose interpretations of Islam do not resonate with the majority we let them have you know, the say we let them you know make decisions for us or I think part of the the social responsibility of living in the West or living in the North is to take the 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 rights and freedoms that we have, the political rights and freedoms to speak out about different things. The most important thing that the Muslims have to do today is to speak up. One of the biggest issues that I've tried to handle since September 11 is this perpetual state of self-denial that I find most Muslims living in. And they pretend everything is okay. And it's not. It most definitely is not okay. Because if everything was okay, we wouldn't have had, you know, 19 men jump into planes and fly them into buildings. But what can we do? to make ourselves better. My first clear Muslim memory is my Bismillah. In my Indian Muslim community, when a child turns four and a half years old, we have a ceremony when he or she recites Surah Al-Fatiha, which is the first verse in the Holy Quran. I remember this day very clearly. All my family and friends were there to celebrate what is seen as a most auspicious occasion. From that day forward, the child begins the study of the Holy Quran. The Arabic phrase Bismillah means in the name of Allah. It is recited by Muslims when beginning anything to indicate the pure intention and to receive blessings from Allah. Thus, I begin this venture with Bismillah. Islam has always been a personal journey for me. I seldom shared my joys, struggles, and discoveries with anyone except a few close friends. At work or at school, people might have an idea that I'm a Muslim, but had no idea what that means. When 9-11 happened, the media was bombarded with images of Muslims, especially women. Muslims and non-Muslims alike were so confused and frustrated, desperately wanting to make sense of the madness around them. I myself didn't trust the media to answer my questions nor to represent me. So I decided to have real conversations with the women in the various local Muslim communities. Yeah, you can take that. How are you? You're not going to get sick again, are you? God, I have hojat on you. When, when I get very upset, I really say, I said, I have hojat on you. When I, come, when I die and then when the day of judgment, you ask me, why you did this? I said, why did you make me different? Why did you give more power to men and then you give me? Most of the Muslim men like their wife to be behind them. You know, if they see their women are moving fast forward for some reason, maybe she's good in business, maybe she's good in but education. Mom, but see, this is the thing. I mean, I, I think you're making a lot of good points and it's not that this isn't the case, but I think men like seeing women behind, you know, like lower than them in any in any society yeah. in any culture, and so. But see, that's the difference no, between me and uh, between Muslim culture and other culture, other society. I mean, you don't see a Muslim, a really Muslim woman go out naked with this much scar, which mark, with this much cloth on her, which be her underwear and her bra. You don't see a Muslim woman dress like them and go out like them. You see other women does it. That's why I don't like to com be compared with, with other people. I want to be compared with all what Quran gave me the right to. Well, see, then the, in that case, then I would say, then we can't keep blaming. Oh, the Muslim man. Oh, the, I mean, we, the Muslim man is responsible for things too. Not to say he doesn't take a part in the whole equation, but we have to go back to the original text, just like you were saying. We have to go back to the Quran. We have to become educated, and whether the guy likes it or not, we have to say these are our rights, and we will we will de we will demand them. You know, like a woman can make her own money. Like even in your own life, you've made your own money. You've bought your own property. You have not shared that with your husband. You have not put. You know, and so it's like we have we have to be responsible. We can't keep blaming. Even just like no, but can't. see, but but by doing that, I'm paying the price of it. I want to do same work as a man does, but the, I mean, the negative which I receive for what I really believe, 
is not is not equal to which man would receive. That's the, that's the thing I'm trying to say. I'm not blaming a man. I'm blame, blaming the the Muslim culture. Who is going to be my son? Somebody's husband tomorrow. A man is never going to come. Even the most noble and religious man is never going to come and be like, here are your rights, and I'm going to help you fight for them. We're going to make sure you get them. No man's ever going to do that. Mm -hmm. That is, our women, I blame women. We don't even question. Well, if this man's saying, mm -hmm. oh, you know, don't laugh. Stay in that little room. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, where, what does that have to do with Islam? Where in Islam? And, and, and yeah, it's not they might be like, you're, you're questioning me? Oh, okay. But, yeah, at some point, it is the duty of, uh, you know, the, the intellectuals or the, one who, the ones who can read and know to, to get right. out. I'm glad you qualified that, though, because you put in a big duty on, um, on a population of Muslims who may not necessarily, I mean, if, if the situation is, is as oppressive as, as we can imagine to be, like, of these countries where, we, where you can look at and see where people can't even you know, drive or leave the home without themselves, then you also have to think about the perplexity and the, and the toll and the burden of just being able to go and independently access the, the, the text, the Quran, and say, and, and actually argue. You're assuming they're going to be these, the, the, this level playing field where a woman or, or a daughter can go and say, look, Father, you know, the, I read the Quran. It doesn't say that. You see what I'm saying? So you're already yeah. assuming a yeah. level of... You know, yeah, some, some yeah, stature of yeah. equality that may not necessarily be there. So that, that's a big duty and a big yeah. responsibility placed on them, but I agree with you. The main reason why I like to wear the scarf is because it's a symbol of Islam. And it's also a symbol of modesty. And it's very feminine. Actually, Muslim women love their scarves, and we have all styles. Uh, if you go to a Muslim country, you can find a different style at a different shop. Every shop kind of has its preferences. You can find all colors, all styles. Some of them have flowers, some of them have patterned. Uh, it's just something that women love, their scarves. Just as women love their dresses and women love their jewelry, it's, it's actually, it's beautiful, but in a modest way. I mean, it's a subtly beautiful kind of thing. It's not supposed to be garish or attracting attention, but there is a feminine beauty about a scarf. And when you wear a scarf for 20 years, the way I have, you really grow to like your scarf this rule, I have to do it, and I don't want to. I'd rather do my hair and, you know, put on makeup and look cute or wear certain things or whatever, but, you know, I have to do this because God tells me to, and it's it's the right thing to do. It's sort of, when you achieve that level of consciousness, you, you're you so removed from from the opinions of people. The, the opinion of God is the only thing that is important to you, and that doesn't make you separate from people. It actually brings you, it draws you closer to people. I know that I would wear hijab and and be really like conscious about the hijab, like how it looks on me. Like I would probably spend a long time in the mirror like making sure it looks okay or how does it look better. You know what I mean? Like I would still be consumed in what I look like even with it on, which is which defeats the purpose, I think, of wearing the headscarf. When you see a woman in hijab, people I know I always ask them questions. They're like, oh, you're Muslim. Like, and they'll ask them something or whatever. And for me to not make myself available in that way is wrong. On the other hand, I also think you then represent Islam in the general public. If I was wearing hijab in Pakistan or in Saudi Arabia, I wouldn't represent Islam, obviously. But if I wear it here, I represent Islam. So then suddenly my behavior takes on I mean, it's like a huge responsibility. Suddenly people are looking at me and if I get if I get angry or if I'm rude to somebody or if I do bad things, then people are like, oh, those Muslims, you know, like, look at her. She's, that's typical or, you know, whatever. You're suddenly, it's just this huge responsibility. So there was a certain time in my life when I looked at being covered as as being oppressed, you know, equivalent to that, yeah. even though the, I know that that's what a lot of non-Muslims think, and yeah. me being Muslim shouldn't think that, but I know that there were things that made me angry that because I'm a girl, I have to act like this, and my brother doesn't have to do this. There was, there's that rebellion that comes yeah. up. How would you deal with that, with those feelings? And yeah. I mean, you can't expect uh, a young lady to cover herself and cover her, her hair just out of the blue. 
you, you prepare and you teach and you educate. When the child is, is very young, you start teaching them and educating them. And, and just like I, my journey to discover hijab and to find out about hijab was a, a, a self-discovery. And, and, and the more you get into your religion and understand your religion better, then you start understanding the motive. So I think, again, education. And that's a struggle you, a woman has to carry throughout her life. At any moment, sometimes it's hard for you when you're very hot. I used to live in Texas. It gets like a hundred degrees in the summertime. Okay, you go out and you just, it's hot. Mm -hmm. But but you wear the scarf and you wear jihad, and that's your jihad. That's my jihad. Okay, we talked about jihad before. So that's my jihad. I, I struggle to keep my faith and I struggle to maintain, maintain the, the teachings and the traditions of my religion. But on the same token, what, what is the responsibility of the male? First of all, both Sex, uh, sexes share the responsibilities. It's not just the woman. The woman covers herself, but the man is to lower his gaze, not to look upon the woman as if, you know, continuously, and not to um, allow himself to, th to think unclean thoughts and to, and to think this way. So, and the man is also required to wear um, loose-fitting garments, not tight-form-fitting tight form garments, too. So. They're both expected to perform in a certain manner, but then again, um, in, re in Islam, the woman um, takes care of the family, takes care of the children, and so, um, and she takes care of the community, and, and so her obligations that when she goes out, she is to fulfill these obligations without causing harm to society. There was a postcard that I'd seen once. And I, I always remember this postcard. It was a, a feminist postcard. It didn't have anything to do with Islam. It was a, a woman. She had a, a really short skirt on, and it said, "This is not an excuse to rape me," was the oh. was the thing. And this is the feminist theory. Yeah. Is the thing that no matter what a woman is doing, she has the right to her body, to her to not be harassed. I think the responsibility should be placed on the man to respect all creation and not to... Everybody is responsible. I'm responsible for my actions if um, a woman is enticing a man through her... Um, the way she's dressed or the way she behaves, mm -hmm. um, and he acts upon the impulse, they're both responsible. What is wrong with looking at somebody and saying, why wow, this person is beautiful, or what, what is wrong with being beautiful, why? It does not, Islam does not hold anything against a woman being beautiful. A woman should look beautiful, okay? God created her beautiful. Mm -hmm. However, I cannot use the beauty that, she cannot use the beauty that she, that God has given her to tempt a weaker willed person, or to cause to mm -hmm. him to neglect his wife, or to, instead of look at his wife, as the most beautiful woman. That's his jihad. It's right. his jihad. It's not the woman, the other woman's jihad to try to save all the men. And no, I think no. that that That's man... That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is the woman is not... I mean, the Muslim woman is, is not to provide temptation. She is for her husband. And this is the relationship that God ultimately wants between the man and the husband and the wife. They to perceive each other as the most beautiful and the most perfect people. Yeah. Hey yo, for Islam, I split from line and line until my lips is like lemon. Leave kufar hanging and spread with warm venom. That Tommy boy ain't seeking leather pants, you ain't women. Islamic thoughts of conscience, watching y'all sinning. With rhymes and thoughts from the beginning. They never looked at, no high respect for whole women. Now I can reckon you a Muslim from the Kufi. You see, these ain't street like. Well, I see, I think, the fact that every child in this classroom comes from a different country, that's, uh, I think, uh, something unique that you can't find in any other place. Also, I think we, we provide here um, the bilingual program. Our program is a bilingual program where children learn Arabic and English and do everything in Arabic and English at the same time. So this is a benefit uh, that they get. So Arabic is not taught as a subject, but we teach all subjects in Arabic and in English. Uh, 
I think it's not really bad that women and men are separated. Sometimes it's a good thing and sometimes it's not really fair. But like, like at weddings, it's kind of like better for men and women to be separated because like not all people feel comfortable being, like not all women feel comfortable being in front of men like at weddings or something. And like at mosques and stuff, like it's not, it's okay for men and women to be separated because like everybody's still hearing the lectures and everything. Like lectures and stuff, I don't think it's fair for the women to be in the back because I believe like their voice isn't heard and I think it would just be better if, I don't know, I think like lectures and stuff we have at a mom would be better if like they were mixed, but mosques and stuff, I guess you can be separated. And at social events, um, I don't know, um, I think it would be better if you're mixed because it's like, what would you know about anything if you don't know about like a different gender and aren't around them? So you learn from where you are and stuff. And schools should be um, mixed, obviously, because when you're learning and growing up, you like have to learn that stuff and how to act around different people, different kinds of people, like different genders. So um, other than like um, religious events, I think they should be mixed. Um, women should be mixed with guys because with different people and that like they have the same rights um, and like if they're at a social event they should um, mix with people too and like if they're praying they, I think they should separate because they should be with the um, gender they are and like they should know like it could be different like if a girl and a man was like with each other because it would be like different gender and like it wouldn't be the same because people, men have different thoughts as girls. Studying about myself, I had the time to not only learn practically from my children what life is all about, the different personalities that you see, I also started uh, studying the texts, you know, I, I've been interested in reading the Quran and trying to see how, how this applies to life in general. And I think I'm blessed that I did not have other obligations, you know, a job or that, that took my time. I could really devote some time to study the text and to study books. And um, it, it's a rewarding experience to be able to kind of synthesize that information and see for yourself what you are here for. I mean, why are we in this world, for example? Um, so. My goals have changed a little bit since then. I started off thinking that I would like to finish my PhD in nutrition, but now I feel like I should study more about more about Islam, more about um, what God has revealed, and um, and eventually maybe get a master's in education or something. So that's where I am right now. Parenting is is by far the most challenging jobs that a human being can take. That's what I think. I think it would have been easier for me to finish my PhD. <laughs>
And I was amazed because when I started reading the Quran, it was what I already believed. And I just couldn't put it down. It was, uh, I read the whole translation in about four or five days. And I, I felt immediately that I was Muslim. Um, it was in 1994, um, I, went, I had the opportunity to be a monitor for the elections in South Africa, the first elections. And as just, I don't, I don't even want to call it fate, I just say divine guidance had it. I spent a lot of time with a Muslim family in Cape Town, um, with Indian and uh, Malaysian, Cape Malays, they're called, in, in Cape Town. And just by the me, my name alone, they were just like, oh, that's a, why do you, what's up with the name? And I told them I was raised as a Muslim. They embraced me, they welcomed me into their home. And that was really, I felt like that was the, that was really a homecoming on so many levels. Um, it was a homecoming because it was the first time, like I've never been to the Middle East. I've never lived in an, like in a Muslim community, so to speak, where, where it was just awesome, where I was living, where I could hear the azan, the call to prayer five times a day. And, and to be with people who were my age and some who were older, um, who were very devout, but also lived their lives. They were part of the world in South Africa. They were staunch supporters of Mandela. In fact, before Mandela was inaugurated, I mean, he'd already won the elections. He came to that community and went to Juma services. Um, and so it was like in the women, definitely when we went to the mosque, our heads were covered, but they, you know, they wore quote unquote Western clothes. I mean, you don't have to wear Western clothes, I'm not saying, but it wasn't like they felt like that it was a contradiction. And there was an ANC party, victory party, and Muslims, I mean, and I went to it, and when I say party, I'm talking about dancing, music. The imam was there dancing. I absolutely consent that the Arab community has had a, a huge influence upon Islam in, in, in America. Mm -hmm. But by the same token, I must say so has the African American community them, themselves. In the recording just earlier, my, my friend Octafe, who's from Iran, her family is Muslim, she herself had indicated that she was struggling with Islam and what brought her back was reading the autobiography of Malcolm X. Wow. And I was like, well, that's your proof right there. You got someone who was born and raised, quote unquote, born and raised in Islam, right? But her, her journey, she struggles through and then her journey back is, is structured by this text by an African-American man. All the, the, the Islamic schools on the East Coast. Who's running those? Right, African American. The African American community. Right. You know, what do you Muhammad? Who did the eat at the at the White House? Right. Who who organized that? Right. So, I mean, so and now right. and like meeting you, I'm like, yay! Here's another example. Sister's, <laughs> sister's mom is Muslim. You know, writing. You know, a scholar. Mm -hmm. So don't tell me that the African American community is not making its mark on Islam and of necessity because the, look at Muhammad Ali. That's right, Muhammad Ali. I mean, there's so, so many all examples. All around the world. So many examples. You're right. And that's the beauty of Islam, such that I think that if Islam was predicated on the eradication of individual cultures in or as a precondition for you to order be, in order for you to be Muslim, it would be nowhere. That's the that's its beauty, and that's why it's so universal. Mm -hmm. Is that you come, you bring it, reckon, you bring all of that in, you know. And the motive, I mean, the beautiful thing about it is that you bring all of that in. But at the end of the day, when we say Allahu Akbar, La Ilaha Illallah, it all means the same thing to mm -hmm. all one of us. All and this time to pray, we're gonna we all bow down in the same in direction. Way. That's the power. Okay? and it's the beauty. And that's like that's what I think is so and beautiful that's about it. that I, you know you can be with people who you don't have the same mother tongue. That's right. And you can just and I think that's what's so powerful to that's me right. when I think about you know the times when I just a lot or even do zikr just that's right. And just to be chanting you know like you said that's Allahu right. Akbar mm -hmm. la ilaha illallah who Bismillah Rahman Rahim. I mean in that same and we right. all know in that one moment that one it's just whoo yeah yeah. So after Egypt, I went to Jordan, and then Lebanon, and Syria, and Turkey. So I traveled by myself through all these countries for over a year. And in each place, I was very, very much into the culture. I was always with the locals, and I felt very accepted. And um, it, was, it was one of the happiest periods of my life. I felt like I belonged there. I, I, I never felt that before any place else. There was this instantaneous feeling of belonging. And I don't know why. Maybe it's because it's 
the religion, but there was something about the culture that really resonates with me. The, the music, the way people are, the, the simplicity of their lives, their generosities. Um, I, I was very, very much at home there. I had to get out of Seattle and I had to just explore myself and my way of exploring is always by traveling. I love travel, it's, it's in my blood. Um, so I just um, told my parents that I'm gonna go see the world and that at the time I had no idea how long I would be gone for. I just knew I had to leave and, and explore. So I bought a one-way ticket to Paris and left Seattle in May of 2000 not even knowing if I would ever come back, just knowing that I was going to be traveling for a while. And I knew at some point I would end up in the Middle East, but I didn't know when or where or how. To me, my favorite country was Syria because it was, it was very authentic and real and the, and the people were just amazing, very, very civilized. And that's one of the things I always tell people here, um, one of the common stereotypes of Arabs is that, oh, they're so barbaric and rude and savages, but to me, they were some of the most civilized peoples on, on earth. I, I was humbled. I first decided to become a journalist when I was in Saudi Arabia, and I think it was this deep-seated need in me to run away, because it was, everything was closed and, and just limited, and I felt so trapped in Saudi Arabia. It was just, I thought, okay, what is the one profession that I can get into that would never hold me down, you know? I could be in a different place every day, like this Omar Sharif guy used against me, but that was the beauty of it for me, that it was it was very liberating. It wasn't your traditional kind of nine to five job that had me do, you know, this boring routine every day, and I could travel. And and being a journalist was, was, was the excuse that I used to break all those cultural taboos against women traveling alone in the Middle East. I could always say, well, you know, Reuters sent me, I had no say. My bureau chief sent me, he's a terrible guy, but hey, I'm loving it. I think that the world is actually separated in two camps. There's people who are activists and people who are not. And I think that the activists are people who are committed in whatever way, um, formally or informally, small or large scale, ways of making the world a better place. So. I, and for myself, I think that the goal of life is, is you know, as it says, is to um, to die when you are pleased with Allah and Allah is pleased with you, and to have lived a life that brings you to that place, and through that being um, being socially engaged in the world and taking my personal relationship with Allah, my personal commitment and my personal understanding of Islam, and and turning that into a social. Uh, social movement for justice, like actually being able to participate in the world around me and work on various different issues, but all towards an end of like creating more justice in the world. Can't even fathom living in North America where we have you know, the choice, well, most of us have a choice of how we practice. I mean, I think that can differ in terms of people's family situations, but we live in a country where the way we experience Islam, the way we choose to live it is, is something very personal to us. To, to then see how Islam can be turned into some, some state imposition on a person's personal choice, that's, that seems so insane to my understanding of Islam. But I think that what, what is our role then as Muslim women living in the West? You know, what do we, how do we respond to that? You, of course, were, were in Saudi Arabia, living in Saudi Arabia at the mm -hmm. time, so mm -hmm. that's, you know, that's a whole different fight. Mm -hmm. But for us, when we look at that, when we, we see the basic human freedoms of the right to, 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 dr to drive. I work at a transition house for battered women, and I know that one of the key issues that we, that we need for women is the ability to leave an abusive situation. And how does that happen in a culture where you can't physically leave? You can't physically leave your home. You can't physically travel down the road. How can you leave the country or leave the city or leave your leave your immediate surroundings if you're in danger? Like those are pretty life and death critical issues. Absolutely, and I think what what we can do as Muslim women in the West is divorce 
Islam from those cultural and traditional things that the Saudis have imposed and not to shy away from criticizing a country like Saudi Arabia just because it has such a central and, and supposed pivotal role for Muslims all over the world. And if the Saudis have decreed that their women cannot drive or that their women cannot leave, that is against the religion because Islam does afford equality, mm -hmm. education, uh, justice mobility. and safety, mobility, and just the idea of being safe. That mm -hmm. has to be guaranteed mm -hmm. under any religious or political system. As Muslim women living in the West, we have the, the privilege of creating a truer, purer form of Islam and setting a role model because when I was in the Middle East they wouldn't believe that you could be Muslim and come from America it just it didn't fit and if you told them that it was like you're not a true Muslim because you cannot go to a mosque you can't pray you can't do this but I think in many ways the Islam I see here is truer than the Islam in the Arab world but in, in regardless of that there is no country that is Islamic there are Muslim citizens living in non-Muslim countries. So our, our view would be how close we get to that ideal. The ideal is non-existent, but here we, maybe we can get closer to that. Actually, my family came here 360 years ago. I'm descended from Thomas Halsey, who was one of the founders of the first English settlement in Long Island, New York, Southampton. And my family's lived in Southampton since that time. I have at least two of my grandparents were revolutionary fathers in the Revolutionary War. And my family is very proud to be American. They fought in almost every war this country has fought. The reason Thomas Halsey and his family came to this country was because of the promise of freedom of religion. So I feel like I'm kind of carrying the torch for my family. I, I'm realizing how strong that flame was in my family that now, almost 400 years later, I'm still, I'm still fighting that same battle for freedom of religion that that my ancestors came to this country for. So this is a very American, this point is very important to Americans. Our freedom of religion is something that is so much a part of our heritage, so much a part of the, the whole history of so many of the people in this country, and we should be fighting for total freedom of religion. Before, there was like the enemy of communism and everyone. After all that, it's like, I think Islam became this giant enemy, you know, and um, I think it's so believable to make it out to be this scary, you know, thing. And I've always said this because, you know, like the when most women covering and it looks very exotic and we bow down and it just looks like, ooh, you know, everything about the faith seems very mysterious. I always just constantly go back to the Palestinian situation, you know, with Israel right now. The Palestinians have been totally stripped of their, um, Human rights are being treated like second-class citizens. Uh, someone who's, you know, uh, you know, let's say born in Bethlehem and who has left and is Palestinian can never return back with that as a Palestinian. But yet, uh, an Israeli that doesn't even live in Israel can return and live there. And uh, be besides that, it's like this, you know, the United States supporting Israel and, you know, politically and making it statements constantly about how Israel is our friend, whereas what that, what does that make Palestine? What does it make the Muslims? And then, you know, when I had interviewed not even um, Palestinian Muslims, but two Palestinian Christian women um, for this article I wrote, they are both like, you know, I was like, well, what about the UN or what about the United States? And they're like, when we get tear gassed or bombed, we go pick up remnants, it'll say made in uh, Pennsylvania, made in the U.S. So for, for them, they don't see the U.S. as their friend. They, and, and it's not just like in their head, they physically deal with it where we don't see that on the six o'clock news or whatever, but it's out there. And um, 
even with another example I can use is like with the uh, Iran Iraq war. It's like uh, Saddam Hussein was a totally sane person when uh, he decided to invade Iran and you know eight years of fighting mm -hmm. with Iran. Even though he was totally treating the you know uh, people in his country, some of the minorities in his country, very bad, poorly, and the CIA, this is you know proven. You can look at Library of Congress or whatever and find this information. He you know was totally aided, supported yeah. by the United mm -hmm. States. But all of a sudden, when the these monsters that the U.S. government creates sometimes doesn't do the tricks that they want them to, uh, then they're bad. In Saddam Hussein, for instance, when people are like, well, I don't understand why they're upset, and we're really not interfering in in these people's lives. It's like yes, the these the powerful governments and especially the United States government, not the people, but the governments go into these certain countries that happen to be Islamic or Muslim or whatever and do interfere or meddle in their business because of self-interest and later on are very surprised at why these people are angry. But all the people in the Muslim world are saying is don't use double standards, don't come and give all this money to our government and then turn around and say, hey, what's wrong with your people? Why, why aren't you doing anything Well, who are we them? supposed to give it to? If we don't get, listen, all of the aid that go, not all, but 90% of it is humanitarian aid. No, it's, I disagree. It's, 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 it's not. It's yes, not, it is. It's it earmarked is for the poor if, people. If you, look, if you look at the aid that goes, for example, to the Egyptian government, it's not humanitarian aid. It's largely military aid. I, I, I tell you that the Egyptian people hardly see a cent. The focus on, on, on this event mm -hmm. and on these few people mm -hmm. to be a defining nature of, of Islam today, I think mm -hmm. that that's problematic. Right. And well, I want to I step away from that, that yeah. dynamic. I, I agree with you that it shouldn't be something that we use to define, you know, to, to identify us, you know, for, mm -hmm. forever, you know, from, from here on onwards. But I think, you know, speaking of Egypt and Saudi Arabia again, because this is what I have a specific um, experience with, you'll find, and a lot of these men and these ideas, you know, can be traced back to the Saudi role in modern day Islam to a large extent. And you'll find that what's happened in Egyptian society is that every issue, including healthcare and women's rights and everything, really has been defined by the ideas that, that gave birth to these men. And, and this, is how I, this is how I feel that is the case. Um, in the 1970s, in the 1960s and 70s, when many members of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt were basically hounded out of the country by um, Gamal Abdel Nasser, many of them ended up in Saudi Arabia. And for Saudi Arabia at the time, their political currency was their version of Wahhabi Islam. And what they would do is they would um, fund many Muslim movements around the Islamic world and basically spread it. That, that was their way of spreading their version of Islam, setting up all these madrasas in different parts of the world, but teaching their version of Islam. And you'll find that Egyptian society has really changed, you know, gradually but surely over the past 30, 40 years because of the influence of those Saudi thoughts. And that change has basically happened as more and more Egyptians went to Saudi Arabia, not just because they were hounded out as political or religious activists, but just because of the poverty in Egypt and the petrodollars. Many Egyptians went to Saudi Arabia and came back with not just Saudi money, but Saudi thoughts. And so you'll find, just as a purely superficial example, in the 1970s, a very small percentage of women in Egypt wore the hijab. And now, if you go back to Egypt in the year 2002, you'll find that the majority of Muslim women in Egypt wear not, the, the, not just the hijab, but the niqab, the actual covering from head to toe, has become much more socially acceptable. And many social scientists have, have traced that directly to Saudi Arabia and Saudi mm -hmm. teachings. Not just that, when these people started coming back from Saudi Arabia with more conservative traditional views or the Saudi view of Islam, they began to oppose the government on what they thought the government was doing wrong, you know, vis-a-vis -vis religion and, and society and tradition in general. And the government tried to outdo them in religion. And so you had basically, you know, a very strict kind of conservative strain of Islam, the government trying to outdo it, the two of them fighting for what Islam is. And Egyptian society basically in the middle stuck between the two of them. And so Egyptian society as a whole now is much more conservative and traditional because of that debate that Saudi Arabia exported to Egypt. So I see it as a social problem in the sense that it has set the agenda for what people talk about, for the way people dress, for the kind of films that are made, the kind of entertainment that is on offer. Everything has become much more conservative. Now, if you want to be conservative in your home, that's fine. But if you're going to be conservative and you're going to set the agenda for me and society as a whole on what I can do and where I can go and how I can speak and how I can appear, that's not fine. Mm -hmm. And that's how I see it as a social problem. Yeah, and I, I totally want to speak about specifically about the, the influence of Saudi money on, on because I think that's here too in, in North America, because if you want to have an Islamic education, if you want to learn Arabic, if you want to study the Quran, and you're from a your, your basic working class North American family, you can go for free, especially if you're a man, you can go for free to Saudi Arabia and, and 
there in Saudi Arabia also funds uh, the salaries of imams in different communities, and and clearly like that that creates social problems within our communities here. And I'm I'm not really familiar with any other context but North America, so I can only really speak about that. But I think that the that is a really distinct what you're speaking about that 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 um, influence of Wahhabism, which is very problematic, and the influence of of a particular understanding of some of of, a, of of how it's taking all of our interpretations towards a certain direction, more like that direction. But the I, I think that that is a very distinct thing from suicide bombings. Like I wouldn't want to link the two so inextricably because I think that there are separate issues or social um, socio political issues that 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 are that are part of that discussion, um, particularly that that are separate. And I want to. I don't want to link the two. I don't want to. I don't want um, the idea that any kind of um, sort of uh, any kind of particular understanding of Islam, also uh, in, as it's applied socially or personally or individually in communities, also immediately leads to pl um, the, under the support of political violence. I just think most of the problems that we see of the Muslim world are are so complicated. They have to do with you know colonization and poverty and just oppression in general in so many forms that women always get the brunt of in all societies in all wars and in all mm -hmm. situations women you know always get the brunt of oppression they, uh, one guy who came and spoke he was this Afghani professor and he said before he said before you know September 11th I went to Isna conferences and all these Muslim conferences and this and that and everybody talked about Kashmir and Palestine and you know Bosnia and this and that and he's like I would always look for somebody talking about what's going on in Afghanistan with the Taliban and I never found it and he said that's that's sort of our internal crisis is that we're so defensive and we're attacked by the media and by everybody it's so much that that we don't want to speak out about our own problems I mean there's problems in the Muslim world there's Muslim violence against other Muslims there's Muslims oppressing other Muslims but he says well his point of view was that that publicly we feel like we you know shouldn't air our dirty laundry or something so we don't criticize ourselves but that only weakens us you know if we don't acknowledge these things and now we're forced to and mm -hmm. and you know he said that after the attacks every you know Muslim leader in every country Muslim political leaders but also religious leaders came out and denounced the attacks he's like where were they beforehand denouncing the what Taliban on, right? and then he said he said, okay, maybe they live in Muslim countries where there's oppressive regime, regimes and they don't have that so much freedom of speech. He's like, what about us? You know, we're Muslims in the United States and Europe. Where were we? You know, we weren't saying anything either. So we're all responsible. Most countries in the Arab world have a huge double standard when it comes to sex in that, but, you know, I, I can speak to, to Egypt because I've seen what men there are like, you know, either men in my extended family or men I've come into contact with through work, where it's almost a badge of honor for a man to have sex with as many women as possible before he gets married and the whole, the whole thing about sex before marriage being against Islam goes out the window when you're talking about men, but when it, when it, when it becomes about women then, you know, the woman's a loose woman and she's let herself go and who's gonna wanna marry her and and you know a woman wouldn't come out in Egypt and openly say that she's had sex before marriage because you just never hear the end of it so women have sex in Egypt before marriage but they just do not talk about it this is a problem the man thinks okay I'm allowed to get they don't see the whole picture they said just four wife that's great I could have four of them but they don't see what he's supposed to do to deserve that four wife. Yeah, I mean, but they said, okay, this is my right to have four. But I'm being such a gentleman, I'm just gonna be with you one. And he gonna, he always keep that. I mean, these are the things has to be solved little by little because 
I don't want Ali Reza to marry for wife. If if he, I mean, as as a mother, if he has a right to be with four women, with this side, these days, you could be with four men. They said okay, at that time they said if you be with four, if a man woman be with four men, then you don't know who is the who is the father. But this day they could tell you who is the real father. Is the Muslim? We don't have no father. <laughs> I personally feel like that. That's the biggest mistake that we make is that like, you know, women, men and women are supposed to be separate for this long period of time and all of a sudden you throw them together and they're supposed to know what to do with one another. You know, I personally feel that like, you know, I'm a single woman. I, I have needs. I don't, I think it's perfectly fine for me to date. When I'm dating, whatever, I don't, I don't feel any shame. And I think that, that I'm doing the, I, I'm setting the, the best example for my daughter because she needs to be able to see that her that her mother can as, assess a, 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 a you know a person's character mm. and determine that hmm, that that is a, is not you know what I'm saying? she needs mm. to be able to have some type of evaluative mechanism you know evaluative things to kind of look at oh well my mom dated this person you know he was Muslim but you know I think that she said something like oh that he he didn't spend enough time or, or they didn't talk about enough things or he didn't take her out and he didn't treat her right so no she didn't date him for very long for me I think that I had a lot of initial guilt because I thought that what I was doing was a sin. There is no, um, right now, real kind of ritual ceremony that acknowledges a union between mm -hmm. two women. Mm -hmm. um, my first partner, when I was an adult, consenting adult, was was a Muslim woman, and she's a very we're very good friends now. We're, we're not involved, and I really I give thanks for her presence in my life because I think she she's she is nine years older than I am, and she was always clear that it wasn't a contradiction being a Muslim and being mm -hmm. involved. So I think that for me, that that helped me not completely sever the tie, so mm -hmm. to speak, from Islam. Because I thought, oh, I can't. I remember thinking I was going to be struck down, literally, by lightning from a lot. I mean, I was just terrified. To understand this, four witnesses. But that, the four witnesses thing is for the adultery. Adultery. The act, uh -huh. the act of committing adultery mm -hmm. uh, or fornication. So... Uh, if someone is accused of committing an adultery or accusing someone of committing an adultery, then they have to have some four people who have witnessed the actual act, which is an impossibility if you think right, about right, it, right? Impossible. And again, it tells you that this is really between the person and God. It's the relationship between the human being and God again and again and again because a Muslim has the belief in their heart that God is with him all the time. Islam says you ha you're, you have three parts to yourself. There's the body, there is what you call yourself, and the spirit. When we say to understand what the self is, it says it is that which you would call your my, me, your emotional thinking person. The body is just a shell um, in which we reside. The thinking, computing, feeling part is really the self. The spirit then is just the command of God that keeps the self in the body, meaning at death the command is taken away. And Islam really uh, categorizes the self into about 13 states, states of the self, 13 ways you can find yourself. Broadly categorized into three, the very lowest form of the self is the commanding self, which we all know, me, myself and I, where you say, my life, my work, my desires, everything is me. And if, if you are in that state, then your, your God really is yourself, because your, your aim is to please yourself. And that is why Imam Ali alayhi salam has said, if you know yourself, you would have recognized God. Who is your God? So if I'm in the commanding state, whatever I please or displease is my God, really. I might say I'm a Muslim, I might say I'm born in an Islamic family, but really I've not recognized God yet. Because to me, everything that is, that, that is associated with me is important to me. The other state is kind of the guilty self, which is where you kind of know the rights of others. You're not that hard-hearted, closed 
within yourself. And if, if you hurt someone, it nags you, it bothers you. The conscience bo bothers you, so your conscience is kind of alive. And that is a blessing because that is an intermediate state. <laughs> Then the highest level of the self would be a peaceful self, and that is what Islam is all about. Islam really means peace, comes from salama, peace, has been also translated as submission, submission to God. Submission of what? What do you submit that you get peace? It is a submission of the self. It is this self that you know as yourself. When you submit that, that means you align yourself with everything that God loves. You stay away from everything that God does not like. If you can do that, there, a person feels a lot of peace. And that is the true message of Islam, is to find peace within oneself, and then it permeates to the family and to the community at large. It's an empowering experience to witness women expressing themselves with passion and wisdom. We are at a time when we can no longer be alone in the understanding of ourselves, our history, culture, heritage, and faith. I'm convinced that opening the dialogue is necessary to accomplish this understanding. I am aware of the incredible responsibility to serve each woman to the best of my ability to have her message heard and her story told. These are the perspectives of people who have chosen a different path in a culture of overconsumption. I am grateful to serve as their envoy. Thank you.